Hey there, neighbors and naysayers. Clint Finney again coming to you on behalf of the Eastern Ohio Grazing Council. We decided we'd do some videos quick uh, just to talk about current conditions with the drought here in Eastern Ohio. And so at this point, we've got some rain and we need to talk about now what? Now what do we do? And and by all means, our thoughts and prayers are, are with those that are affected by Hurricane Helene and, and all the things that they're going through. Um, we are thankful for the rain, but uh, those folks are dealing with some real issues down there. So we need to keep that in mind. But let's talk about what, are, what do we do now that we've got a little bit of rain? First, I think it's important to, to realize that, yeah, yeah, we've got a little bit. Uh, but they're they're saying we're 15 to 20 inches in some places below normal on rainfall and, and this little one inch to two inch three inches of rain reported locally isn't going to bring us out of the drought it's going to turn things green for a little while but i don't know that it's going to bring us ahead much as far as forage production goes and if we continue to get some rain that's fine um, we may go back to normal sort of grazing conditions it's it's not going to replenish our groundwater supplies but it may get us to a point where we can actually grow some forage and we can all be hopeful of that uh, but at this point um, two three inches of rain really isn't going to bring us out of, of the drought that we're currently experiencing if we look back historically to the 1988 drought that we all talk about uh, we were getting three inches of rain pretty much a month even in the, the 1988 drought and still had those major things and that was the milestone up until this year uh, as far as drought conditions go so at this point we still need to be keeping the livestock off of the bulk of our pastures. And I say bulk of our pastures because we, we may be using an area or a pasture for, for a sacrifice area or for feed and hay. Um, we need to let that forage go ahead and grow and, and get some re resources and some reserves built into its roots. We need to let it get its head poked above the ground and start pulling in some sunlight, uh, both because we want to grow forage and because we want it to survive the winter. So just because things are greening up, we need to hold. I, I think of the movie Braveheart and, and a line in there, hold, hold, hold. We need to hold those livestock off of that pasture and let them go ahead and, and get ahead, get some pasture growth ahead of, of us before we turn them out. The other thing I, I worry about too, I just thought about this this morning was, you know, we've got uh, livestock on dry hay at this point, 90% dry matter, and now we've got wet growing forage. It's going to be probably rather high protein um, that we would be grazing. We, we need to be very careful of that, and, and it would just behoove us to keep those livestock in. And I know that's going to be difficult to an extent. It's going to be difficult at my house to keep cows fenced in because they're going to see that green growing grass and want to move to it. But we really, as far as the health of our pastures go, we need to be holding those those livestock off the pasture until we get a sufficient amount of rain and growth both don't be afraid to sell some cows um, those bottom 10 percent at minimum um, we we at, at my farm we're we're, as, we're down as far as we've ever been as far as numbers go um, I just did some quick math and realized that feeding that bottom 10% uh, was going to cost me more than they were worth. So I needed to move them on. And, and my idea and estimation of this is I could sell that bottom 10% and help to buy some stored forage to be able to get the rest of the herd through. Uh, don't be afraid to do it. Uh, we all need to have a list of, of that bottom 10% and move on and, and keep them in mind of, of the ones we need to move. I even sold deeper than that. I sold feeder calves that I didn't want to sell. I wanted to keep, but um, just desperate times call for desperate measures. And so we had to move on. And thinking about our sacrifice area or where we're going to feed hay, um, think about those poor fertility spots are hard to get to fields, fields that you wouldn't normally feed hay on in the wintertime. This is a perfect time to be feeding some hay on them. And at this point, too, we, we may have fed hay on a field for two or three months. It may be getting pretty full and it may be time to move on to another field and start in the sacrifice another area. Uh, and if, you know, if you've got a heavy use pad and you want to use that, that's great. Um, I don't like to use heavy use pads in dry or hot times just because I don't want to have to haul the manure. Uh, our, our, our resources as farmers are, are limited as far as time goes pretty hard anyway. 
and if I can keep from having to haul manure when I don't really need to, uh, I'll do that. So I pretend to, to pick a sacrifice area in dry times and warm times rather than use, use a heavy use pad. But if a heavy use pad is the option you have, then by all means, go ahead and do it. And the last thing about feeding those those livestock, cattle, sheep, whatever it may be, we need to be thinking about how we're doing it. You know, are we going to unroll hay? Are we going to use bale rings? If you're on a heavy use pad, do you have bunks? Be thinking about the way you're feeding that hay and how much they're consuming with quantity of hay uh, in mind. And we're going to talk about quantity here within the next few slides. The other thing to consider, though, along with where and when we're feeding hay is, is where is your water and what quantity do you have? Remember that sheep and goats are going to drink one to three gallons a day. Cows, 20, 30, 40 beef cows, especially, or, or is what I'm talking about here, dairy cows, even more than that. And they're only going to walk efficiently six to eight hundred feet to water. So as we're picking out our sacrifice area or thinking about moving to a different sacrifice area, we need to keep all those numbers in mind. Now, I would even estimate those numbers to be just a little bit higher. As I mentioned before, we're going from a, a, a forage or grass that is 90% water and 10% dry matter, roughly. I mean, that's not even close to the real number to feeding stored forages that are 90% dry and, and only 10% moisture. So they're going to drink a whole lot more water because they're on stored forages. So just be mindful of where you have water and what quantity it is. Uh, and, and also probably what quality it is. We need to be thinking about that as well, but keep those numbers in mind. And that may mean, as our groundwater supply gets lower and lower and lower and we're really not replenishing that you may take a look at some of the videos rachel put out about um, moving your herd around and doing different things to be able to get them watered you may put up your herd completely together because you've got one good source or you may take them apart and feed them in different places and that's one thing we've done at home is we've we've got three different groups right now that we're feeding i don't want to do it that way but that's the way that we can keep them all watered so be flexible again desperate times call for desperate measures realize what animals can be together and what animals can't and, and put them together if you need to be or, or take them apart and feed separate herds if if you need to this is also a time to be talking about our stored forages what quantity do we have by by most estimations uh, the beef cows sheep goats whatever are going to eat three percent of their body weight hopefully we all know what the body weight of our livestock are if we haven't and we're selling that ten percent now's a good time to figure out what that body weight is and then figure that over the number of days that we're we're going to be feeding it and my number for that right now is I, i'm calculating to feed completely through to may 1st we can all be hopeful that we're going to get water and we can all be hopeful we're going to get more pasture and we're going to get more growth at this point we have to realize where we are in time though our time is is limited uh, it's october 2nd as i sit here today uh, we're going to get maybe 45 days worth of pasture growth that's at my house that's about a month i could maybe get a month of grazing out of that i don't want to count that i would rather have enough forage on hand to get to may 1st and and if we get forage growth great that means i'll have extra stored forages left over at the end of, of the winter and may 1st uh, so that I, i'll have a little bit extra left over i mean i'm feeding into my extra now that i've built up over the years and, and having a little bit left over isn't going to be a bad thing also realize if we're feeding stored forages we've got waste there that we've got to deal with on the grazing side we talk about this in utilization rate on stored forages we, we need to think about how much of that hay there or forage they're actually wasting and it can really vary depending on your feeding method depending on how those bales are stored or how, how whatever forage you have is stored it really can change a whole bunch we we figure at home in bale rings we're losing about 30 percent uh, if we're on rolling hay, we're losing 40 to 50 percent of the hay we feed. And that's why we have switched to, to feeding in bale rings at home, because we just simply can't afford that extra waste. I would love to unroll more hay, uh, but the cows seem to be using more of it in rings and they seem to be liking it a whole lot more in the ring rather than um, being unrolled. So we went exclusively to bale rings. And then this is a time to be checking your 
stored forage quality as well. Uh, because of the drought and because of the quality of forage that we've made, um, we need to check that. I know my own forage samples are lower, not significantly lower, but lower than, than past years. And I've got cows and, and everything's on hay. I don't have any stockpile grass. So, so that forage isn't good enough for some of the classes of livestock I have. And so some of the stored forage that I need to buy in, I need to buy in, in a better quality forage so that I can mix it in with my stuff to be able to keep those cows fed. You know, usually I talk about, well, we, we put fat on the cow's backs all summer long through, through good grazing, and we can afford to take a little bit off during the winter. Well, that's a typical winter for me is five months. At this point, my cows are probably going to be eating hay in excess of nine months. I can't afford to take that much off of the cows. We need to be able to match our forage quality with what the livestock really need. And, and that's not easy, but we, we start that by taking a forage sample and figuring out what we need to do. After that, you know, we may buy in some better hay. We may look at byproducts. We may feed some shelled corn or soybean meal. Um, protein tubs are out there and available. I, I will say that protein tubs have, have a use. They just have a limited use as far as protein goes. There's only so much the cows are going to consume. So at some point, we need to go either to a better quality forage or, or a different product. The protein tubs will help and will, will boost what protein or what forage we have. Um, but if we're talking about a large change, we may need to go to a different source of some kind. All right, with that, uh, I hope we've given you some insight on what we do now, now that we've got some forage or some rain, I guess, and hopefully some forage moving forward. Um, stay tuned here on Eastern Ohio Grazing Council's uh, YouTube page. Uh, we'll be putting out some more videos as the days go by and as conditions change. We're really just trying to help you all out. We're really trying to supply some timely information uh, that'll help us get all get through these trying times. I mean, this is pretty much we're in un, uncharted territory at this point, and we're just um, trying to, to give good information to producers to not only help with the drought, but also to help our forages, our farms, our livestock come through this winter and come into spring with a limited carryover effect because of the drought that we're experiencing. With that, I'll say we'll see you next time.